Sorry about that. Okay, so my colleague Bruce Nordman yesterday gave you kind of a big picture perspective on efficiency of IT equipment. I'm going to talk a little bit more at a very high level about the whole range of different kinds of equipment. And then I'm going to focus in on some of the lessons that we've learned over the last few years from the world of cloud computing. And it turns out that a lot of those lessons apply also to device design. So it's not just about uh, supercomputers or data centers. It's actually uh, the lessons also apply to these uh, smaller devices. So I like to break IT down into this set of categories. This is one way to think about it. Uh, you have your end user devices, so desktop PCs and other office equipment, copiers, fax machines, and so on. You've got your mobile equipment, smartphones, PDAs, laptops. And then you have the cloud, which I'm defining here loosely as everything on the other side of the uh, Ethernet port in your office. So uh, there's other ways to define that. But everything that's not in the direct control of the user. So that would include networking equipment as well as data centers. And then there's embedded systems. So these are electronics, the electronic devices that are used to control industrial processes, to control appliances, that generally use a tiny fraction of the electricity use of the whole device, but actually have a very important role to play in making those devices more efficient. And so one of the big themes of the talk here is to think about not just the few percent of electricity use that is IT equipment, direct electricity use by IT equipment, but the other 97% of the electricity use, as well as all the other energy use in terms of oil and coal and other fuels that can be affected by clever use of IT equipment. So I've plotted here a, a conceptual graph. On, on the y-axis, we have effort on uh, changing software operations and usage, x-axis effort on hardware. So there's different ways you can approach efficiency in these devices. So one way would be to focus on low power modes. This is what Energy Star does in general. And that's mostly a software play. That's mostly people looking at existing gadgets, maybe changing a few little things in the devices, but mostly it, it's software. You also have approaches where people just switch out power supplies, for example. So the 80 plus program, which gives a label for computers that have uh, power supplies of more than 80%, uh, you have here. Uh, I like to think about combining those approaches. And uh, Luis Barrasso at uh, Google has talked about what he calls proportional computing, which is making the energy use of these devices track the actual usage or utilization of these devices. And that tends to be, usually people focus on the, the uh, CPU level or the motherboard level. But there's a further step beyond that, which is what I'm going to call here device redesign. So taking a gadget, pushing the hardware to the max, but also spending time on the software and operations so that you really get the maximum efficiency from each device. Turns out, though, that device redesign is not typically enough to get major efficiency improvements. Sure, you can get, you know, you can get 20, 30, 40, 50%. But if you want to get radically better efficiency, you have to think about the whole system, not just the device. So Amory Levins of Rocky Mountain Institute has talked for a long time about clean slate whole system redesign. And what he means by that is to start not with the gadget, which is what many people do. They look at the gadget and say, how can we improve this component? How can we can make this, this piece work together better with that piece? But instead, think about the tasks that people want to perform. And then figure out a way to completely redesign the system from scratch, uh, ignoring the, the constraints that may have been passed down from history, and uh, thinking about how we can make these products superior in many ways. Typically, efficiency by itself will not sell. You have to combine it with other attributes. And when you do, you end up with a very substantial uh, market share. You end up with very substantial profits for these devices. So one, one example that I like to use of whole system redesign is the iPhone. Now, it took 20 years for people to make a phone that I actually wanted. But beyond that, it wasn't just a device gadget. They also have focused on creating applications to make this particular device. It's, it's a whole ecosystem, as you all know, of software that can be downloaded for this machine. So now I have this 
single device that, uh, that does photos, that does, I have my little HP calculator that I had in graduate school. Now it's on my iPhone, little free app. Um, so, but that was a whole, so basically thinking about the whole system led them to create much more consumer value than if someone had just said, how can we make a better phone? They and that's- finally put voice dialing in. They finally did the they most recent one. Voice dialing. Yeah, so they finally did that. But th the point is that starting from scratch and thinking about what people want to do is a very different approach than taking a device and trying to make it more efficient. So I wanted to kind of bring that up in the beginning of this talk to get you all to think about that broader perspective because I think it's an important one. So I like to think about data centers as the place where the world of bits meets the world of atoms. So we're used to thinking about the computer equipment in those facilities, but we also have the power uh, distribution equipment, the uninterruptible power supplies, you have backup diesel generators, the HVAC system, and as you'll see, later on in the talk, in typical data centers now, the total annualized cost for this other equipment to both purchase it and operate it is comparable to the total annualized cost of the IT equipment. So it used to be 10 years ago that IT equipment was the bulk of the cost of the data center. That's back when data centers cost in the tens of millions. Now that they cost in the hundreds of millions, a fair chunk of that cost is actually the other stuff. All the stuff you don't think about, all the support equipment related to power distribution, backup power, and cooling. And that's an important thing to think about when you're analyzing these systems. So how much electricity do data centers use? This is something that there is some recent analysis of. Uh, this is from a journal article I did in 2008. There's also the EPA report to Congress that Bruce and Rich Brown and Eric Massonet and I worked on for EPA that does just for the US uh, historical data and forecast. And this shows for 2000 and 2005 what happened with data center electricity use. So a couple of key lessons to take from this. One is that the electricity use roughly doubled in five years. Another is that half of that electricity use is actually not IT equipment. It's the cooling and power distribution. So that's another, you know, it's not just the costs that are half and half, it's actually the, the energy use. That's very typical in these facilities. You also see from this that of this doubling, the growth in data center electricity use, most of it comes from what we call volume servers, the pizza box servers, blade servers, the stuff that's generally uh, high volume sales. This is where most of the growth has happened. You even saw in the mid-range servers a slight decline in electricity use. You also see uh, communications, networking, and storage here as well. But most of the electricity use in the IT equipment in these facilities is servers. Most of that is volume servers. So in 2005, the total for all data centers was about 152 billion kilowatt hours. And for some perspective here, uh, this plots the total electricity use of certain countries. And you see that uh, data centers fall in between Iran and Mexico, countries with 70 to 100 million people. So it's a very significant amount of electricity use we're talking about here. So it's, it's, again, about 1% of world electricity use. So here are some of the big issues that we've learned over the last few years about electricity efficiency in these kind of facilities. One is that the service demand for IT is going up very, very rapidly. Another is that efficiency is also improving very quickly. So it's not just that we're using a lot more, we're actually being a lot more efficient in how we use that electricity. Even with that, there's a lot of efficiency potential remaining. And one of the reasons for that efficiency potential is that throughout this sector, there are misplaced incentives. There are uh, people who are being rewarded for behaviors that are not uh, reducing the total costs of the service being delivered. And that's something that needs to change. And that's not just true in data centers. You also see it in, for example, set-top boxes. The people designing set-top boxes don't pay the electric bill. They want to create the absolute cheapest gadget that they can to put on your, uh, on your shelf under your TV. And that means that they're not going to spend an extra $2 on the power supply to make it more efficient, even if, they, uh, even if that would save the consumer 5 or 10 and so this is a, this is a generic issue throughout uh, IT equipment. 
You also see pervasive issue of low equipment utilization. So this is true in data centers. It's also true for your personal computer. We're typically, in servers, we're looking at typically 5 to 15% utilization for servers and data centers. That's a lot of capital sitting around doing nothing. There's also discussion about the, what, what I'm calling embedded carbon and energy versus usage carbon and energy. For most equipment nowadays, the usage, particularly like say if you look at cars, you look at desktop PCs, usage is the main contributor to carbon emissions and environmental impacts. But when you start shifting to mobile devices, that equation starts to change. It's something you need to think about going forward. And then there's these general issues of boundaries, focusing on the direct electricity use, which is important. We need to be efficient about that. But also thinking about the indirect effects on the other 97% of the electricity use. So we know that IT services are increasing rapidly. Uh, Andrew Odlisko used to work at AT&T has a nice uh, site where he tracks internet traffic. And he shows from 2002 to 2008 median growth of about 50% per year. Now, you also see in PCs the number of computations you can do per computer doubling every year and a half. So this is a manifestation of Moore's Law. And you see not just individual PCs becoming more capable, but also the number of PCs going up. So you have the, the installed base of PCs up, uh, desktops up about 9% per year, 2000 to 2008. Laptops going up 24% per year. This is data from IDC. IDC shows in 2009 for the first time that laptops are surpassing desktops in terms of sales. So we're starting to see a displacement there. That has implications for the direct electricity use of this equipment. So IT is also becoming more energy efficient. And so here's a plot of the electricity intensity of the internet. And this shows on the y-axis electricity intensity, kilowatt hours per gigabyte transferred over time. And back in 2000, we're looking at between uh, 95 and 160 kilowatt hours per gigabyte. But by the time 2008 rolls around, we're somewhere between uh, 5 and 10 kilowatt hours per gigabyte. So what's happening here is that the rate of the number of uh, gigabytes being transferred is going up very rapidly. Uh, it's typically going up at 50% a year. But the electricity use of the data centers are actually going up only you know, 15%, 12 to 15% per year. So in terms of service delivered, we're becoming a whole lot more efficient very quickly. Now it turns out I, ha I was not able to uh, uh, show these data for this talk because it has to be reviewed yet. But I've done analysis now of the kilowatt hours per computation over time, going back all the way to ENIAC. And one of the interesting things about that is that that has actually doubled every year and a half for the last 60 years. And so we're seeing this application. Moore's Law has a big effect not just on performance and cost, but also on the efficiency, electricity efficiency of computation. Yeah. Excuse me? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Well, that was so. You know, this is basically the the intensity is going is basically having every two years. So it's. We're still looking at something about five five kilowatt hours per gigabyte. Yeah, something like that. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah, but that's again having every two years. So. Okay. So. That means we took the total data transferred over the internet from Mudlisco, the total electricity use by that equipment, and divide it. So okay. a lot of idle, idle, idle. Sure, 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 sure. So you you the, the difference between marginal, this is basically, we need, for doing these kind of calculations where we're trying to allocate, we need some way to allocate that electricity use. The most logical way, in my view, is to say, here's the data transferred. Let's allocate that electricity. I understand that there's a, a lot of sitting around time for this equipment, but it's something that you know you need to allocate it in some way for these aggregate uh, issues. Yes, in the back. This is the total. Okay, so this is the total data flows as measured by Alisco's uh, tracking across all the the major sites on the internet. So it's within the U.S., but he this is his aggregate picture of total data flows.
Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, so let's let's move on because I got to get. I only have half an hour here, so we can talk about this at the end. Um, so there's still, in spite of the historical progress, there's still great potential for proving uh, efficiency in data centers and other IT equipment. So this is from the EPA report to Congress, and you see under current trends substantial growth still in electricity use, uh, but even just by improving operations, there's substantial potential for savings, and uh, with best practices, significant reductions are possible. So capturing this efficiency is more than just a technological question. So you have to think as much about people and institutions as you do about technology. One of the reasons for that are the set of misplaced incentives that get in the way of efficiency. So we know in many of these facilities, uh, people do not even track the energy efficiency metrics at all. You don't have standardization of these metrics across the different, uh, different facilities or across the industry. You also have people not charging users per kilowatt, but per square foot. 90% of the infrastructure costs in these facilities is actually directly related to kilowatts. So if you're not charging people for the cost they impose, they will act in a, in a suboptimal way. You also have split accountability. So depending on who pays the bills, you end up with all sorts of strange incentives. Uh, you also worry about who bears the risk of failure for change. There are hierarchy and culture differences between different parts of these organizations. You also have people putting safety factor on safety factor, uh, which again results in a lot of uh, underutilized equipment. In general, this all falls under the rubric of people not focusing on the total cost for delivering computing services. So here's a graph of total annualized costs for data centers, and it's plotted as a function of IT power, so the direct electricity used by IT equipment divided by the cost of that equipment. And this is from an analysis I did of total cost of ownership uh, funded originally by IBM through uptime and there, in this case, we're at about 80 watts of power per $1,000 of IT equipment costs. And at that level, about half of these total costs are actually the power-related costs. So infrastructure costs as well as electricity costs. Now, these are annualized, so it takes into account the lifetime of the equipment. Uh, and so we're now roughly in the range where the capital costs of the uh, infrastructure and the energy costs are comparable to the annualized IT capital costs. That's a relatively new development. Back in 2000 or so, we're over here, and IT was a much larger fraction of the total. So what's driving this? You have, this is power per server cost, so that's that x-axis on that, and you have performance per server cost and performance per power uh, what's been happening over time is that performance per server cost has actually been uh, going up, let's see, so going up faster than performance per watt. And so that is driving this particular parameter up, power per server cost. If you think about the total annualized cost of computation, putting aside the utilization questions, which needlessly complicate this, uh, for this conceptual example, you don't need to worry about that. So annualized total cost of, of the data center divided by annual computations, there's a number of pieces of this. You've got your IT capital costs. You've got your kilowatt-related infrastructure costs. You've got your non-kilowatt-related infrastructure costs, energy costs, O&M costs uh, divided by annual computation. And so these two terms are directly related to power. And so if, if you as an IT designer focus on reducing performance per sorry, increasing performance per server cost, which is what you think about, right? You want to get the no, most number of computations per dollar expend, spent on IT equipment. You're forgetting about these other two terms, which turn out to be a very important part of the total cost of these facilities. And you're starting to see the manufacturers realize the importance of this as they change the way they design their equipment. So the big lesson from this is that you have to think about the whole system here. You can't just think about the server. You have to think about the whole system in which the server is embedded. And if you don't, you are going to create costs in other parts of the organization that you did not expect. And it, you end up with you know, people in the IT organization buying servers that, have, uh, that, that end up imposing costs on other parts of the organization. Unless you have uh, one person in charge of 
the data center, one person in charge of all those costs, you don't get people focusing on the total cost. So we talked already a little bit about utilization. Here's some data from uptime through a, a uh, report that McKinsey did. So you see this is server utilization here in 45 facilities. Uh, Ken Brill at uptime thinks uh, 10 to 30 percent of servers are actually we call comatose. They're sitting around using electricity, not doing anything. Uh, you also see underutilization of the UPS systems and the cooling equipment. So in this, in this group of uh, data centers, a third of the sites are less than 50 percent utilized for this equipment. The average is about 55 percent. So that is another area where you have a lot of capital sitting around. Now you need some of that for redundancy, but a lot of it is driven by the fact that people are not thinking about the whole system. They're thinking about uh, their little part of it. So in terms of embedded carbon and energy in general, uh, the usage carbon energy is much more important than the embedded issues, but uh, as soon as you start shifting to mobile devices, that equation is going to change. For data centers, the direct use is still dominant. The biggest environmental story, however, is not about the direct electricity use. And this is the lesson that comes in over and over and over again. Uh, that's relatively small. It, the big lesson is how does IT affect efficiency in the broader society? Why is that? Well, IT magnifies our ability to improve decision making. So getting smarter is a good thing. And moving electrons is always less environmentally damaging than moving atoms. So dematerializing is a good thing. So in terms of getting smarter, IT allows better data collection. So wireless sensor nets, uh, like the moats that people on campus have developed, real-time control in industrial processes, uh, analysis. So an example that I like to use is Wattbot, which is a, a, a software program that allows consumers to input their uh, characteristics and then helps them make better energy choices. On terms of the dematerialization side, Amory Lovins at RMI likes to say, move the electrons, leave the heavy nuclei at home. Telecommuting is one example, telepresence. Uh, sending electronic files instead of documents. And this is a, a brief example. The Uber geeks can come and talk to me about how I calculated it at the end. But uh, I, I wanted to figure out what was the mass difference between moving a sheet of paper versus moving the electrons in a PDF based on that 7 kilowatt hours per gigabyte for the, the uh, data flows. And the ratio is about 300,000. So what we're talking about here is we're moving a whole lot more. If we move the mass, we're moving a whole lot more. Okay, so important lesson, the direct electricity use of IT is an important thing we need to think about, but these indirect effects on economic productivity and other energy uses are actually very large, and we can't ignore them. We need to think about using IT to help us get smarter and how to dematerialize the society. We also need to think about the whole system if we're going to make significant changes in efficiency of this equipment. So we have to think about whole system clean slate redesign. We need to think about both software and hardware. We need to think about people and institutions, not just technology. And we need to think about both the direct and indirect effects of this equipment. So I don't know how much time we have for questions, but I'm happy to take any if there are. We definitely have room for questions. Thank you, okay. Jonathan. In the back. Wait, so okay, what kind of systems? I didn't P2P, hear you. Peer to peer. Peer to peer. Peer to peer. Well, okay, so there's different ways to think about this. One is you've got your uh, individual computers, which are now going to be on more, and they will they don't have all that extra energy for cooling, and there probably is backup power on them, so that, that's not removed. But on the other side, you have the cloud computing suppliers actually have economies of scale and the ability to get much higher utilization on their equipment, because they can spread lots of different kinds of users over their equipment, whereas if you have, for example, an internal uh, data center within a company, or you have your own little you know, server rack in your house, there's only going to be one set of users or some you know, relatively homogeneous set of users. The bigger you are, 
the more, you, the more diversity you have in your load, the more you can spread those loads over your equipment. You also have economies of scale in doing things like implementing chargeback per kilowatt instead of per square foot. And so in terms of the efficiency of delivering certain kinds of computing services, I think you'd be hard pressed to do better than Well, then you're taking, okay, so there's, a, yeah, there's, there's different kinds of economies of scale. There may be different kinds of diversity, but you as a supplier of IT, whatever it is, your website will have a certain set of users, right? It's unlikely that, that the usage pattern for that is going to be the same as some, someone else who's doing some other task, set of tasks. And so by combining... You know, getting at this utilization question, I think, is really critical. By combining those different kinds of users, aggregating them, I think it's going to be more powerful than, than just... Yes. We can talk afterwards, because I think I haven't quite gotten your... So uh, not, to, not to quibble with the, the, the thrust of the, 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 the conclusion you just made for the, for the question, but one of the takeaway messages I thought I got from your uh, talk was that even for data centers, the efficient the utilization efficiency is at, in fact very disappointingly low. Yeah. And so now, but so while you argue they have economy of scale and so forth, and that's probably better than Avade sitting there serving up well, you know, uh, software or whatever it is on her website, it's probably even worse. These aggregate, this economy of scale really isn't being captured anywhere near as efficiently as it could. Did I did I get the right message? Well, no. Okay. So the important distinction, though, the data that I showed up there was for members of the Uptime Institute network who revealed their information. <laughs> and so it doesn't include Google, doesn't include Microsoft's internal facilities. The big guys uh -huh. are capturing those economies of scale. The big utilization issues, the ones where people are really not utilizing their equipment very well, are the, the internal IT organizations that don't have the ability to spread the usage and don't have the economies of scale. And they have internal problems of, for example, doing chargeback. For utilization is at max around 30 to 40 percent. Okay, well that's a whole lot better than five. I agree. So I guess could you give us some examples of things you've learned from whole system redesign at Berkeley? For example, have you redone the applications so that you can tell lower levels of hardware and software about what resources you're willing to trade for power, power versus performance? Have you come up with resource allocator, energy aware resource allocation? Um, have you got things at the low level that just, you know, load up the most efficient equipment to 70% or something before they even think about using another computer? Okay, so I don't, I don't run the, the servers at LBL, so I don't, I'm not actually, I don't know what, they're, what techniques they're using there. Uh, Bruce, you might be able to say something more about that. Uh, no, I don't either. So. Okay, so yeah, so it's sorry. That's you know, I. Can you tell us your utilization? I don't. It's the, I know I have some specific data from those guys on specific servers, but I'm not familiar with their the the big characteristics of their installation. Sorry. Okay, I can take one more question. So I th I think one of the key points you pointed out is this different accounting between capital and running costs. I mean, in, in my experience, there's been lots of different types of equipment that the energy costs over the lifetime ends up being significantly more than the equipment. Yep. You know, you come up with options to make the thing take less power, and it's like, oh, no, that's too expensive. Yeah. You can't possibly do that. And, and, it's, and so, so perhaps you could comment on maybe maybe legislation or prepaying for electricity when you buy your computer. I, I, you know, maybe it's something radical like that that, for, that forces... Well, I, I don't think we have to go that far. I think that when you talk about cost, you have to say cost to whom. And if the IT department buys the computer and the facilities department pays the electric bill, the IT department is not going to spend an additional dollar on a more efficient power supply. So they could be saying perfectly legitimately, you know, this costs us money and doesn't do anything for us. And the solution, I believe, is actually internally in the companies fixing those institutional issues so that there's one person at the top who's responsible for the total cost, and he gets those people in a room and he bangs their head together, heads together until they start thinking about the total. That's so much easier said than done. Oh, I know. 
I know. But if you're going to get significant improvements in these kind of facilities, you're going to have to have that. And some companies are starting to do that. Yeah. You might find people very rapidly changing that, but that would take legislation. Well, that. well, you could imagine companies. I mean, yeah. you could you could imagine people charging. You, you basically, you're still talking about a shift between who pays, right? You're saying attaching it to the IT equipment make the IT people pay for the cost. That's what, that's another way to do what I'm talking about. You don't necessarily have to do the head banging, right? But it's I think. There's, uh, there's, many, there's so much efficiency that's possible here, and we have to figure out better and different ways to bring those cost consequences to bear on people's buying choices and operating choices. And what you've described is one way to do that. Getting them you know, to focus on total cost by changing the organization is another way. All right. Thank you, Jonathan, Thanks. again.